Thank you all for coming. I'm uh, Peter Gallison uh, from One Building Over uh, in History of Science and Physics. And this is a film by me and Rob Moss. Uh, Rob is chair of VES, and he's unfortunately at the big faculty meeting of FAS to, uh, I guess we're integrating two programs over there. But he will be here for the Q&A, and we'll have a discussion um, then. And anything you're curious about discussing from filmmaking, music, animation, politics, and we're in a great place to continue the discussion about law and regulation, which plays such an important role in uh, the disposal of nuclear materials, even for 10,000 years. So uh, I don't want to spend more time talking about the film now, but to invite you to see it, and then we'll resume. Uh, it, the film is uh, 80 minutes long. Thanks again for coming. Peter, Kate, Rob, Martha. Why did you guys make this film? Uh, well, I think the, the motive force for it was really a fascination with this moment when out of bureaucratic and legal considerations came this extraordinary sort of state science fiction request to imagine the very far future, 10,000 years, unimaginable amount of time. 10,000 years ago, Stonehenge was 4,000 years in the future. Um, so we wanted to think about that, and we liked the juxtaposition of that with the very real and immediate fact that the waste isolation pilot plant in New Mexico was underway and operating, the first of the active licensed operating such deep repositories in the world. And we began there. We had already collaborated on a film called Secrecy, and uh, we teach a course together called Filming Science. So we were, in, we were interested in questions that are of immediate political and practical concern, but also have a kind of otherworldly, imaginative, or uh, elusive content, and this really appealed to us. And then Fukushima happened in the middle. We've been, we were filming, um, we've been sort of filming probably for two years when Fukushima happened, and uh, at the, you know, we started, as Peter said, with this kind of notion of how do you warn the future for 10,000 years? I mean, just that question was so sort of mind-blowing and, um, and somehow visual, and then it was located in a particular spot in southern New Mexico where they were meant to mark for this 10,000-year period. And, and I think that, you know, it's like as filmmakers, we're internally optimistic, <laughs> and we sort of thought maybe that would be the film. Uh, we'd go to the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, we'd think about the future, and that could be an entire film, and that was like how we started. And you know, while we were doing that, we said, well, maybe we need to expand it to talk about where the, the waste comes from, in this case from the Savannah River site, where 40% of the plutonium for Cold War weapons production was produced. And a lot of that waste comes to the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, so we were kind of drawing a kind of larger nuclear map uh, towards the, the waste site that we were doing and towards the future. And then we thought, well, maybe that will be the film. The film mm -hmm. That will be the film. The film will be those two sites in the future. And that makes a kind of tripod, a certain kind of triptych. And then when you work in nonfiction, you know, what actually happens out there in the world um, constantly trips you up. And um, besides being terrible for the world, it was terrible for our film, <laughs> um, which is one of the terrible things about documentary filmmaking is it puts you in a certain uh, relationship to actual events. Um, and some, somehow we had to make sense of this event, not only you know, just as human beings on the planet and what it meant for the environment and what it meant for our nuclear futures, but it also meant something for how, how we could think about it in terms of our film. It took us another, I don't know, another year and a half or two to get there, even to get to Fukushima. And once we were there, the, the kind of... Um, the, the, the profoundly disturbing um, sight of these empty towns and um, the ways in which it undid people's lives and the ways in which um, even what a nuclear accident looks like in the landscape, because you can't see it. And what you're seeing, for example, in many of the images is the tsunami damage or the earthquake damage. 
And that's what it looks like you're filming. But what you're actually filming is the displacement of time because it's two years later and you haven't had a chance to do anything about it. And you're actually filming a time displacement. And that's often what nuclear does is it, it kind of distorts the time frame that you're in um, and leaves, it, leaves something like a vacant lot for decades. Um, and I think there was a moment where Peter and I looked at each other coming back on the airplane thinking, well, maybe this, this idea that the future has now visited us, that all the attempts to keep things out of the biosphere had actually happened, and that the future was now, um, maybe gave us enough um, movement in the film to complete it. Kate, you know something about policy. <laughs> Could you say something about whether a film like this would have any audience among policymakers and whether the time scale that's imagined by this film is something that policymakers can even imagine. Interesting. Uh, thanks, Martha. And I was actually afraid you were going to ask if I had a policy solution. To this, <laughs> uh, that I, I can't claim to have that. Um, I, you know, I do think, it, you know, one of the things that has, is difficult about this issue is the fact that you can't see it, smell it, mm -hmm. taste it. It's not as if, I mean, we're living very close to a Superfund site that is um, contaminated by radiation in Concord, Massachusetts, but it's, it's not, you don't have the same sort of active day-to-day -day clamor about it that you would if it was this obvious, ugly site. As you're saying, the devastation that you were seeing near Fukushima, Fukushima was not because of the radiation. So I think any, any uh, time you can tell a story about this and you can try to create a visual around this problem, it can add some urgency to it because it's, I mean, what's really fascinating to me mm -hmm. about this is sort of the, the, the different time scales and the different sort of um, the varying abilities that we have in, or in this issue to think short term and long term. So for instance, um, all of this came about uh, citing this particular facility looking for long term disposal for Savannah River for the high level radioactive material. Um, has been taking place since 1982 it's with the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. I mean, 1982 comes many decades after we started generating mm -hmm. this material. And the statute begins by, with a finding that says a national problem has been created. And for 30 years, the federal government has done nothing about it. So Congress was being quite open about the limitations thus far and then set out a process for finding places to store the material. But I find it so interesting, and I, what I really liked about the, as like a little segue about the movie, was that, you know, from that legislation, you ended up with DOE R&D and EPA standards that gave rise to this kind mm -hmm. of long-term thinking of how do we warn people 10,000 years from now about these dangers. And yet, you had near Savannah River, um, you had the signs that said no fishing but didn't explain why. Mm -hmm. And so we're not very good still today at conveying mm -hmm. the danger and the urgency and the public health hazards. And yet we're spending a lot of time under this same legal framework thinking about people 10,000 years from now. And I, I wondered about that, uh, that timing and those different signs and the different ability to communicate and what you thought about that when you were... Well, one of the things that we were struck by was you know, the Savannah River separates Georgia from South Carolina, and the waste plant, the Savannah River site, is on the South Carolina side. Uh, and the river, it's, very, it's hard to get across the river, and the, there's an African-American community where the preacher that shows up in the, in the film and is sort of our, in, in some ways, a philosophical voice in, in the picture, but he lives in a, in a, in a quite poor community. These are, these are wood wooden churches. Uh, there's seven of them in that little county, uh, right clustered together that work together. And they're, you know, they're red dirt roads. You see some of them there. They're, people live in, I mean, it's really tough. And they don't tend to get, uh, a few of them had jobs over at the South Carolina facility, but as in many of the cases, we saw the people, especially poor people that live near the nuclear sites, don't benefit. And the people that live farther away do. You see that on Indian an Indian reservation that we went to near Minneapolis. So they, they're like spitting distance to the reactor, not a weapons reactor, but a power reactor. They don't get power from it. They don't get jobs there. And so the sort of not in my backyard actually gets it wrong. It's actually the people often, uh, you know, the, the, their relationship to 
the, the site makes a big difference. And so you can have an inner ring of people who are actually not getting work there, then an outer ring of people that do, and it's, it's complicated. And in the case of the waste material, it's, it's driven through uh, across the country. It went through Santa Fe, which is, a, as you know, a wealthy uh, and influential community. And they got money from the federal government to build a bypass road. Uh, I mean, unimaginable for the people that live right, right next to it who are, have no road at all. So uh, they didn't want these trucks going through and, you know, encountering an accident. Um, mostly it's been a very safe transport, but they have had an event where someone fell asleep, the truck fell over, the canisters went on the road. They didn't break. But, you know, it's not, you know, you, these, are, these are complicated operations. So the space is part of the story, too. Um, one side of the river has warnings about how many fish you can eat. 25 kilos a year was the limit. But the African, and there's a footnote in the paper that I read on this, and it, and it says, of course, African-American communities often eat more than this because they're subsistence fish. I mean, they're, you know, they're, 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 they're living off the fish. So one side of the river set, warns people and the other side doesn't. The river's not very big. I mean, it's, there are places where, you know, you could, you know, it's 20 yards across. You could swim across easily. So, and the signs depend very much on which state they're in. Um, they're, some of them are rusted away completely. There's a kind of industrial ruin to the whole site of Savannah River. They, it's only a tiny fraction of the people that used to work there. Many of the other big nuclear sites are falling apart, too, and the signs. It's like Chernobyl. You know, there's signs there that are rusted through. You can't read them anymore. We had, at one point, some Chernobyl material in the, in the film, but it, in, in a way, it was like the Savannah River story, but, but uh, farther away and farther in the past. So there's a kind of duality between the space and the time, you know, that, you know, who gets to decide, the local community, the southern part of, this, of, of New Mexico, the whole state of New Mexico, the region, does Mexico, you know, it was obvious, no, I mean, Mexico never, entered, I never saw a single document that said Mexico ought to have any voice in this, and they're closer in Carlsbad to Mexico than they are to Albuquerque. So, you know, it's not, the whole thing, and this is repeated all over the world, uh, with questions of environmental justice and local control. And the same thing is true, as Rob says, with time. There's short time, two years, four years, six years. Some of the nuclear isotopes after an accident decay in a matter of days. Other ones last, you know, billions of years. So it's, it's really, uh, it, as Rob said, I think, and, and there is a kind of weird distortion of our whole space-time system, which is completely inadequate to deal with this. We have no, our politics are two, four, six years. That's not even a start. The comparison between a physical monument and stories figures prominently. And it's hard not to think about this film as a story. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm interested in how you think about that and how you think about the audience and how you think about, is this a monument? And... It, it, <clears throat> it's a monument to losing money in making documentary <laughs> films. <laughs> um, <clears throat> thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I think we we were somehow aligned with the. With the, with the centerists in the movie, that they had to think about how to warn the future, how to come up with stories to do that. And we had to do something similar to that. How do we, how do we communicate to people to, and to think about the danger? There's a couple of things along the way. This is a, a bit of an aside, but um, I sort of love this. But when Mr. Sasaki goes home... The older man. The, for, for his 200th time, um, he turns on his left turn signal when he turns into his driveway... <laughs> It's like there's nobody for like, you know, like hundreds of miles. It's like, who's he warning? Um, it's a kind of habit. Um, it's kind of beautiful. It's very human. Um, it's reflexive. It's almost unnoticeable in the viewing. Um, when the woman um, who's going under the truck to sort of check the truck to make sure that it's in good condition, even that whole scene I find so touching. Um, you know, it's like the hoses. <laughs> you know, it's like great that somebody's doing it. Um, but it has this wonderfully futile feeling that she kicks the tires at one point, and I think, why is she kicking the tires? It's like, why do people kick tires anyway? I don't know. Uh, it seems like probably a habit from the 30s or something. Um, 
uh, but we do, and, and, and that we've got this instinct to warn the future, and this, this relates to the storytelling piece, that there's something about our, our humanity that, the nuclear, that things nuclear provoke in a variety of ways, and among the things that it provokes um, is this desire to warn people and to think about the future and, 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 and in timescales that we can't quite imagine how to do, and then, and then, you know, what lasts, and all the questions that the markers panels had to think about and the centers had to think about, and that we have to think about in, in making the film. And it was, there was the, the combination, um, there were two things that, that happened. One is we knew that there were these tsunami markers. So the, the, the Japanese... Um, to warn people not to build below certain areas, like left markers for people. And, and the guy in the film, um, uh, Imamura. Im, Professor Imamura, says, um, you know, how beautiful it is, and not beautiful, I think it's beautiful, even though it's complicated, that, that Japanese people look at them as archaic and kind, of, and kind of interesting as this kind of like artifact from the past, not really as a warning. They, they don't think that it's for them. It was for somebody in the past who probably was, didn't, you know, didn't heed the warning while they built their vacation homes on the beach. Um, and then, of course, I think, well, everybody who lives in San Francisco lives below the tsunami warning marker, you know, that there's going to be an earthquake there at some point, and just like there will be a tsunami along the coast. And that just as human beings, we kind of learn how to live with risk and how do we break through that? How do we, you know, even if you tell people it's dangerous, you know, you have to gauge what that even means. Uh, will you take that seriously? And then at the level of, you know, I think in terms of the storytelling about the film for the future, you know, does it galvanize a group? Does it, can it possibly penetrate policy? You know, does it have, um, Peter and I had the great good fortune of going to Australia in November. We were there for a couple of weeks and we had a variety of screenings. At the same time that the Australian government was thinking about turning the entire country into an international nuclear waste site, as well as looking for individual sites for the first time ever of making local waste sites for their, for their very small nuclear waste product. They have one research reactor. Um, and of course, they're thinking of putting them in places where people can't afford to say no, where they don't have the political clout, often in Australia. That means Aboriginal communities. And the film has been shown you know, over the past two months, like on the sides of buildings or on sheets outdoors, you know, with blankets, with activists sort of saying, this is nuclear waste, this is the problem. If you're thinking of agreeing to this, this you should maybe think about what it looks like. And it just looks up, the film looked very different there um, as, a, as a kind of both information piece, warning piece, story, um, and it was marker. a marker Yes, a marker in itself, and that it was communicating to people who've lived on the same piece of land or somewhere near for 25,000 years, as Aboriginal communities have in Australia. Um, so the idea of what the land is and what it means to poison it means something quite different. It's to me so striking how beautiful the film is, how much the images are beautiful, how the cowboy and his relationship with the cows is beautiful, and the poignancy of how we've ruined this planet really comes through. In a minute, I'm going to open it up to see if people have comments or questions. But Kate, do you have a, I don't know, when you watched it, did you think, if only I could show it to, who would it be? Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, it's really tough to say because I, I, I don't, um, you know, while I was on the Hill, I was actually, I, I um, was a director of a, of the staff of one of the subcommittees on the Environment and Public Works Committee. It's the committee that oversees the NRC um, and it was interesting when it, both of the commissioners that were in this, this film, who are excellent, um, thought very highly of them. They were being vetted, and they, they, were, um, they had been nominated while I was there. Uh, both of them, though, had to go through a personal vetting process with Majority Leader Reed, then Majority Leader Reed. Uh, and the, the reason we don't have a permanent disposal site today is because of Majority Leader Reed. Uh, Yucca Mountain had been selected in the mid-1980s. Nevada had, and under the statute they're allowed to do so, vetoed that decision, and Congress had overridden that veto, and so it was full steam ahead. This was when we were talking about, does the community have a voice? The community at every level there, tribal, council, state, local, nobody wanted it there. Um, and it was only for the cloud of one person in one particular position who was able to convince the president to announce we were not going to explore Yucca further. Um, so it's a really complicated 
matter, right? Do we show it to him? But his, he represents a constituency who stood up and said they didn't want this there. Um, but then you have Commissioner McFarland making the point where if it doesn't go there and it doesn't go underground somewhere, then we have it above ground in 70 sites. Um, I mean, I, I could certainly see having staff and members of the, the Environment and Public Works Committee seeing this. What conclusions they would draw from it, I don't know. Um, but it, is, it was a really powerful movie. I really appreciated watching it. So. You know, one thing that occurs to me when, when you're speaking is that, I mean, Rob and I are also drawn both in secrecy and this film and other things we've discussed to problems where there isn't a clear solution, which goes slightly against the grain of a certain kind of now popular form of documentary film, where you know, if, if only we did X, if only we allowed charter schools, if only we, you know, uh, banned plastic water bottles, if only we, I mean, th that there's like, there's some evil prowling the world, and there's a solution which this film will alert you to and tell you how you can assist with that. But the, I, you know, one of the things that's true for both the way we ended up thinking about the question of you know, should there be secrecy, national security secrecy and democracy, or in this case is you're, you're looking around, you're looking at a spectrum of extremely difficult, you know, attempts to resolve something, none of which are panaceas. No, there is no, but the underground waste, which we ended up thinking was probably the best thing to do with leaving it on the surface for all the reasons Alison McFarland says is really problematic. Uh, is, it, is and launching it into space, which is most people's first reaction, would be catastrophic. I mean, even when our most precious school teacher is launching into space in front of every school child in America, rockets blow up. And if it's a garbage barge going into space, it's going to blow up a lot more frequently. Um, putting it under the water, putting it on the poles, you know, digging into boreholes. I mean, all of these things are, are problematic, and probably burying it is the best, and it's going to leak but it may not leak as much and it's gonna be safer than these other alternatives. And I think that's, that's important uh, to, you know, to, to, to reckon with as we think about these things. And the activists who, we didn't know what they'd think about the film. I mean, we really had no idea. Um, because a lot of them are against burying it. They wanna keep it on the site where it's produced as a kind of thumb in the eye of the nuclear industry. And they'll say things like, the, people who benefited from this nuclear operation should deal with its consequences because they want it as a kind of warning shot against future sites being built. But that's a, you know, as in the cases we discussed, the local people are often the least benefited from it and it could be catastrophic, you know, somebody shoots a, something at, a, at one of these outdoor tanks full of stuff. So it's, um, I, I, I think that Part of what our, our hope in the film is to, is to, is to create a discussion to, to get people thinking you know, in a world where not, no alternative is magic. No alternative solves the problem. Deal with the best thing. Deal in the real world of, that we inhabit. And the activists ended up, you know, in, in Australia and many other groups, we've been talking to Greenpeace and you know, uh, Friends of the Earth and other, and they, they actually engaged with it. And so that was surprising and, and very nice for us, but we didn't know that they would take that view. We have a small documentary film project here at Harvard Law School with the idea that this is one of the tools for advocacy these days, but I very much appreciate the point that it may be the most important kind of documentary film is one that doesn't have a policy solution that is telling a story that will create a myth or create a concern or an understanding of complexity this is a classroom that, unlike most of our classrooms, has photographs of the litigants, the parties in lawsuits. Um, and so bringing the visual into the legal experience is something we're trying to do, but it doesn't always tell you what to do. It tells you that they're human beings, and now what do you do? Uh, comments, questions? Anybody? Hannah? Uh, thank you all so very much. This was really uh, excellent. Um, if I'm not abusing, can I ask two questions? Um, so my first, I, a couple years ago, I had a college professor show us the film called Into Eternity. I don't know if you know it, which is, I think, sort of the same idea. They're trying to figure out um, how to label the nuclear site in Lapland. I think it's Finland. 
Um, and the same questions of like, how do we project doom into 10,000 years? And I guess, so the first question is, is there communication between, for example, the folks in Finland and the folks in Nevada and, or New Mexico? Importantly, it's not Nevada. Um, is there communication across projects that are doing the same thing? And it, to the extent that they come up with the same solution, do we think that that's the answer to how all humans view doom? Or if Finland comes up with something different from New Mexico, what does that say about how we should label things? Because not all things mean the same thing to all the people. Um, and then I guess my second question is, how this relates to the issues of climate change, in as much as climate change is driving us maybe toward the use of nuclear fuel, but we have such, this is so visceral in such a way that climate change, it feels like isn't, and it's maybe doing just as much or more damage right now than this is doing right now. And so why is this so, why, why can we hang our hats on this and be so viscerally affected by this when whole islands are going underwater and we're not, you know, you can't smell that either, but we we're not doing anything about that. Um, I can, I can, I'll take the second one since I'm first. Um, it's a totally good question and I, it's something that Peter and I talked about a lot. And uh, I think one simple answer, it's not a very comprehensive answer, but you can't make a film about everything all the time. And um, this is a topic that I've never quite seen, the nuclear waste idea. And, it, it, and also thinking about it from the, the point of view of the future puts a certain lens on the present that also seemed like a way in. And that one of the things that we found that I think has been surprising and kind of great is the film's had a kind of life in the art world. Um, we've had an installation, it's been in like a number of galleries and then also we did an actual installation in a museum in Austria. That was incredibly fun and interesting. And the point of this is that there's some way in which the way that the film is and the kind of thing that it's about, uh, and maybe the storytelling piece as well, it's hard to tell, um, has allowed younger people into the discussion that there's something about things nuclear. It's a kind of middle age preoccupation um, in general, and not for everybody. Um, and that it's been, you know, it's like, I think my experience of the young people kind of, fine, I got, you know, it's like, you grew up like duck and cover, okay, I understand, but you know, we have other things on our minds. Um, and that this has been a way for them to kind of en engage the nuclear issues um, uh, in a more personal way, something about the graphic novels, the storytelling, and the way that it's sort of constructed. So, and these things are linked to bigger issues like climate change, you know, without being about climate change in particular, but it activates different pockets of conversation and inquiry. And um, we hope that it leads to such kinds of questions and also leads to questions. It's, I think it's an open question, like whether nuclear ought to be. I mean, the question of whether nuclear ought to be at the front of the list, is this the only thing that's standing between us and global warming Armageddon is nuclear power? And there are people who make that argument. There's some people in the environmental community who make that argument. There have been films that deal with this argument explicitly. But our film doesn't. It does, has a different way of going at it. And, um, and in, in some ways, once you've engaged the polemic uh, and something that's so highly politicized, then you create a kind of portal that you have to show your credentials before you can enter the life of the movie. And we didn't want to do that. We wanted to make a film that was more open than that um, and that you could think with us and that didn't have a climate of terrible fear in every moment um, and then didn't try to kind of market that somehow. It was just our idea. On the first uh, question, um, there are international. There is a big international project on marking that uh, mostly the European Union has been involved with. America has some representatives in it, and you know they they've looked at various different possibilities for how to do that. Um, and you know we we tried to allude to some of the things that were these were these this project was started in 1989 1991. One of the problems we had in, or that we had to address early on was what the style of representation of the future should be. And very early in the filmmaking, we decided to, go, to use a graphic novel as a way of capturing the scenario like, which, you know, these are like, comes out of the old Herman Kahn, you know, Cold War scenarios. You know, a, a nuclear weapon goes off at an American military base in Germany. What's the response? You know, it's like, they're like fragmentary uh, sketches. They're not worked out, detailed accounts. They're not novels. Uh, they're, they're, 
you know, they're the kind of sketches of the future. And we thought that something more sketch-like, more less continuous motion, less detail, would actually capture a, an image of the future that wouldn't seem immediately dated. You know, if you see the matrix now, you know, with its little green cathode ray tubes, it doesn't look like the future. It looks like the time it was made. And uh, that's a problem with science fiction. I mean, unless you're a complete genius like Kubrick, but, you know, modulo two or three films, most of them look like the six-month period they were made in. And so we wanted to have something that was a little retro, but looking forward and would capture that sketchiness. And they thought even the people that made the scenarios talk about it as being like a movie scenario, like before you get to a script, like a storyline or a log line. And, um, so there is an attempt to try to look at this, but we tried to sort of gesture to the various attempts. Do you, do you use language? Do you use pictures? Do you use pictograms? Do you, uh, yeah, do you try to make a kind of Rosetta Stone? Do you have layers of, of the development from the monuments down and buried deeper and deeper into you know, the sum total of our knowledge about cancer, physics, nuclear power, and so on? Um, or do you eventually use scary forms? Or you know, do you try to make a kind of a story that will be handed down like a Homeric story before Homer actually wrote it down, like that sort of... Um, the kind of thing that um, Peter McMurray here knows a lot about, but sort of the stories that are told and what's been understood by, for instance, a group here at Harvard many decades ago about studying oral traditions and how they work, and then using that to try to understand how Homer must have worked. So, so there's, there are the, all of these elements uh, from the arch landscape architectural, which clearly built on kind of earthworks of you know, like Smithson's uh, spiral jetty or you know, the kinds of things that were being built <clears throat> out in the landworks in the desert back in the 80s. So, I, you know, we, we gestured to that. And there, are, there are different things, but the awareness of the cultural specificity of these things was there even at the time. And there were debates among the people making these. One of them, for instance, uh, in the film, the guy with the petroglyph T-shirt, who is the, an artist, his name's Lomberg, John Lomberg. He hated, he's an artist, and he hated the, some of the forms that were made by the landscape architect, Mike Brill, because he said they were artistic. And if they became artistic, no one would care about what they signified. And Mike Brill said, no, 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 we want, we want something that has a kind of or form, because that's the only thing that's going to transmit. Anything that's as specific as a series of images, you know, we'll wonder, you know, it's like skull and crossbones. Well, 10 minutes from crossbond, you're in Mexico, where... Skeletons mean something entirely different than they do. They're, they're not a symbol of uh, you know, danger. warning and danger quite that way. There can be a celebratory uh, image. So I, you, they, they tried asking people on the street. One person read the this, this sequence of images backwards and said, why is this person getting better after they, <laughs> after they open this can? <laughs> and so, I mean, it's, uh, there are all sorts of... And then they said, oh, well... It, 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 it's true, cultures read right to left or left to right, but no one reads bottom to top. Well, maybe, you know, <laughs> 10,000 years from now, no idea how they're going to read. So it's, uh, it, it is something that everybody w was worried about, and they were trying, you know, in the end, they thought, well, we're going to do everything. We'll throw the kitchen sink at it. We'll use forms and equations and astronomical charts that will show the apparent position of the North Star as a way of gauging time since burial. Uh, we'll do uh, you know, uh, all these things. And the scenarios that get wilder and wilder, uh, the thing, one of the things they were most worried about is there's oil underneath the site. And if you can actually look at a, a map, I mean, a, a, Google Earth, image. A, a, a Google Earth image, and you can see the boundaries of the site by where the drilling holes stop. I mean, they, they form a nice two, by, two mile by two mile square. And in fact, the drillers, we spent some time with the, with the, with the oil drillers, and you know, they'd finally gotten, you know, they do slant drilling now, and they'd gotten permission from the DOE to clip under one of the corners at 8,000 feet below the surface. And the guy told us this, and then his, his sort of lieutenant said, you know, Johnny, don't tell them how deep we're <laughs> digging. You know, that's our proprietary information. So, you know, it's, uh, it's as soon as they, as soon as they 
guards stop guarding, they'll, they're going to drill. So that was a big... And then they tried to estimate how likely it was by looking at the rate of drilling uh, per year and then projecting to 1,000 years in the future how likely it was that a future borehole would go right into the waste. So you can see this is difficult. Other questions? Comments? Bert had a question here. Yeah, Bert. Uh, a couple of good, maybe more comments. And I thought it was visually very beautiful. I thought it was visually quite beautiful, and there were a lot of very moving, touching scenes, and, uh, which uh, uh, was great. And, uh, uh, I, and I think there were a lot of really interesting ideas being presented. It, it may, several, maybe quite orthogonal ones, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't know whether it's confusing or not, but it, I mean, certainly uh, th there was, the, for example, that you have this very rational presentation by uh, the, uh, the former- uh, Allison McFarland? Uh, McFarland, yeah, uh, which I, you know, was very calm and, and, mm -hmm. uh, no, and, and, and really stated the issues mm -hmm. in a way that I hope people mm -hmm. think about. The, um, it really deals on the question of do we bury it or not bury it, not how do we mark it if we do bury it, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a, in some sense a little bit of icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. uh, as you say, there's no way we're going to be able to be absolutely sure. We can do the best we can. Uh, we can only hope that uh, people will be, uh, that if people have the technology to drill, they'll also still have the knowledge uh, that there's something peculiar about the site. Uh, it, it, obviously, if you wipe out humanity and you have just uh, uncivilized uh, nomads running around, mm -hmm. they won't know anything, but then again, they probably won't be drilling for a while either. So I, these are issues that I, I think mm -hmm. one could try to bring out, but again, I, you don't have time to go. I'm sure these were all discussed uh, ad nauseum by all You know, the one of the things they were worried that. about was, you know, after the fall of Rome, present-day Great Britain went overnight from a very sophisticated trading and technological society and extremely literate society to the Stone Age again. And what they were one of the things they were most worried about was the period between um, being able to drill and knowing about radioactivity, which is a fairly short couple of decades, right? So uh, they were worried about that on the way down or on the way up, you know, if, if civilization sort of collapses and reestablishes itself over the course of 10,000 years, which seemed imaginable to them, that in crossing that danger zone of being able to drill half a mile underground and not knowing about uh, radioactivity, you could get yourself into trouble. And sp there's a technical part of that, which is what you're really worried about is that you drill down through the site, open up to the, to the, to the, to the radioactive materials, go further down, and hit a compressed brine, you know, brine salt water pocket and that that'll then shoot up and bring the waste to the surface. That's what you're actually worried about. And uh, it's possible, there is brine down there, it is under pressure, and you could get to it uh, in an effort to try to get to the water underneath, for example, or oil, or gas, or other, other things. So, you know, yeah, it, it's just, it's a, it was one of the things they worried about. One other, so, so you may, I think you may have mentioned, why 10,000 years? I, it, it, I can see that maybe you can't plan for more than 10,000 years, uh, even the thing is going to be there for 240,000. But, but it surprised me that they would think of a, a sign that says, you shouldn't drill here before uh, 12,000 AD, but it, it's OK after that. So that. That seemed like a bit uh, right. bizarre. Can you explain that? Mentality? Well, it, it, was, um, it was the largest number they could imagine writing down that people wouldn't laugh at and we could take seriously. <laughs> It is, it is interesting, though, because 10,000 years is a, is a time scale that the U.S. has used across these decisions. Um, but in 2004, so it was 2002, Nevada vetoed the use of Yucca Mountain, and they were overridden by Congress. So then Nevada started suing the U.S. government on various things, trying to hold up the siting. And one of their points was that EPA had set 
uh, radioactive standards for Yucca Mountain as a disposal site only from now and out 10,000 years. And the National Academy of Sciences had said that you would have half-lives in radioactivity far after that. Um, so they actually had to, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals told them they had to go back and change the rule and go out one million years. Wow. So right now, these rules, which are not applying anywhere because we don't have Yucca Mountain as an option anymore, actually go out, set radioactive standards that EPA considers safe out to one million years. And plutonium decays into uranium-235, which has a much longer uh, half-life. And if you integrate over all the different isotopes and where they, what they produced, the maximum radiation exposure to a person on the site, uh, and it was the National Academy of Sciences that set the million-year rule, and on that basis, and they said we're calculating it uh, based on the exposure to uh, the best estimate of who will be there, which is either a casino worker or a defense worker. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm picturing some species, our descendant species, that's like as the relationship to us that Homo ergoster, which was a million years ago, has to Homo sapiens sapiens, and you know that they're going to be running casinos. I love this idea, right? And, Is one million any more conceivable? I mean, it's less conceivable. It's, it's all less. inconceivable. I mean, we're not us in a million years. Yeah. That's for sure. And the EPA isn't around to enforce a standard. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's the other thing. Good point. Hi, thank you. Uh, so my question kind of touches on a topic that was brought up earlier, and it might be beyond the scope, but just looking at the film and talking about the, the magnitude of the problem, it just begs the question... Uh, you know, why are we still doing this? And I'm just wondering to kind of narrow it down a little bit, what were the discussions like uh, that were maybe going on in parallel to this discussion of what should the markers be? Uh, was there any thought of, you know, sh should we think of an alternative solution or should we be making some sort of contingency plans in terms of energy? So if you could just talk about that. Um. Take, take it for a second, Peter. I'm thinking about something, but I'll come back to it. Um, do you mean... So one question you could, ask is, or, or, or you could be asking is, what are the alternatives to burial? Or the other might be, what are alternatives to nuclear power? Or what are the... What is your, can you specify the question a little more sharply? The alternative to nuclear power. So the waste is there, right? There are tens of thousands of tons of waste. And the question is, what do you do with it? What the WIP site was originally authorized to do was to bury, it stands for Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, and they were only authorized to bury weapons waste, and only weapons waste that, was, that <coughs> included things like plutonium, which are higher on the periodic chart than uranium, and um, only that satisfied, that were, not, that were not produced in reactors. So it was a complicated and highly specified set of wastes, which they then expected to be able to broaden to other forms of waste. And right now, even though they're closed for this now $700 million repair of the, of the plant, um, they're hoping to bury both surplus plutonium from weapons production, the actual s concentrated metallic plutonium, and uh, not just lab coats and test tubes and sludge, uh, but the um, and they want to they like to be able to bury their the power rod, the rods from nuclear reactors, so those those have would have to be subsequently the remit of the burial site would have to be expanded to be able to include those. But there's a separate question: is should we be building more nuclear power plants or more nuclear weapons? Um, that's distinguishable from the question of what do we do with all the stuff we have. The problem with the stuff we have is that. The nuclear power rods are in these 90% in the world, 80% in America, are in these big swimming pools, which, is, which are totally unsatisfactory. I mean, they're just, they're, we, what we should be doing is leaving them there until they're cool enough after three years and then putting them in, out of these pools. The problem is if you have these very hot rods and they caught fire, as they almost did at Fukushima, they could ignite the whole kit and caboodle 
and then you'd have a real catastrophe. That's what the Prime Minister of Japan was afraid of when he said we might lose Japan. So that's one problem. But, um, and then there's the burial of the, we the weapons waste and eventually other things, and how do you do it? And then a third problem is, should we be continuing with nuclear power production in the future? And some people say, uh, yes, this is actually a good idea in light of global warning, warming. And then there's, there's a, a small number of uh, people who identify themselves as environmentalists who say we should do this. So it's a complicated issue, and there are those different parts of your question. And I, I just to, I was trying to like come to this, and it's as there are a couple of people in the film who make reference to this question. Lomberg says maybe we shouldn't make more of this stuff, and Woody Sullivan says I don't really believe in nuclear power, and I'm not sure that if I'm helping it, and I'm somehow promoting it, but it's here, so maybe I can lend my expertise into thinking about the problem. As speaking for myself, it seems that. There's a gravitational pull to um, the rhetorical issues surrounding anything nuclear. And people come to the issue with tremendous ideas and passions that they come already have. And that in films, when you engage them, it just inflames people's pre-existing ideas. Um, that's one of the ways. I mean, I think you can make films that are very powerful and have a strong point of view that do argue for something. I think that's great. It's a certain way to do things. And I, and I find that valuable. But we were trying to not engage that, not to like raise the specter of your political beliefs that are previously held and that you see confirmation of uh, or that you take issue with. Um, it wasn't that, it's not how we imagined it. And we really imagined it as trying to take the issue, um, as Peter says, the existing issue, that the stuff exists anyway. This is not about necessarily even producing more. Like even if we produce nothing more, there's just tons everywhere that have to be dealt with. And as soon as we engage the nuclear, more nuclear or less nuclear, that just goes away, and then we're back to where we started from. So it was just a decision we made as a way to think about it, to not put the accelerator down on the fear factor as much as we maybe could have, thinking that fear is not a great environment in which to engage things. Um, and also not to make you have to choose. And good political activity does make you choose. And this is a different kind of political activity also to make you think about what these issues are and to maybe come to the conclusions that we have but that we don't lead with. Thanks. Okay, There's a so, question there. Yeah, it's me. Um, I have a question. I didn't understand something, um, so that's my first question. Um, the, uh, the cartoon, the Nikki, the nuke, Mm -hmm. Is it your creation or it's their creation? All the scenarios were designed under contract to the Department of Energy, responsive to the requirement of the Environmental Unicorn. Protection Agency, which, which was trying to specify how the congressional approved law, the, the, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982, should be enacted. So 1982... NWPA is passed. 1983, the Federal Register prints the rules as promulgated by the EPA. And then in response to that, uh, the, the Department of Energy had to assemble a team of experts to imagine these scenarios in order to create the constraints under which the warning monuments would be built. So those scenarios, all the scenarios illustrated here, are uh, DOE produced out of the... Uh, one of the big weapons labs, and then um, the monument designers built those. The illustrations to illustrate those are by a great uh, graphic novelist, Peter Cooper. The monuments they designed, they actually drew, and we used those uh, working with a different 3D animator uh, to create the fly-throughs and the images that you see of those monuments. Those monuments are the mon are among the monuments that were produced in responsive to the EPA requirements. Well, okay, I asked about the, this uh, character, Nikki Dunuk, right? That Everybody... was one of those scenarios. Okay, so that was not yours, it's theirs. Okay, it so that's very theirs. interesting because uh, it's an example of the narrative that um, is used to try to reach out 10,000 years, or now we're talking about million years in the future, and to try to depict something um, like a warning or a story, right? Yes. Um, and it's interesting to me, so if you compare that 
I mean, it's Mickey Mouse, right? Yes. It's what, uh, 80 years, 70 years? That's about the span of Mickey, between Mickey Mouse and Mickey the Nuke, right? Yes. Um, so when you compare that, and then you, and it's a young nation, United States, as you said, 200 years plus. Um, so that's the narrative that comes from that cultural background. Uh, but you mentioned, and I'm glad you did, the, uh, the Australians and the Aboriginals. Of course, they're going to do whatever they want with their land because Aboriginals really do not have any voice. Uh, but what they do have, um, they, they actually do have a voice. It's just that we never really listen to it. Only now we pay thousands of dollars to see it. So if you go to Harvard Art Museum, you can see a wonderful exhibition. It's very small, but I'm noticing there in the last maybe 15 years, there are more and more Aboriginal paintings, exhibitions in the United States. And you will see um, the, the painting, the cave paintings, but also their, um, uh, I guess, sand paintings. And now they're putting them on the, on the uh, canvas and, and the board. Uh, they're just about 10,000 years. Um, so you can see that they've preserved their narrative for thousands of years. They're not much different today. Uh, they just have more materials. They can use better paints or, you know, it's just slightly varied. But the narrative is almost the same. And it's because they didn't have much influence from around and it's a very, very old culture. Uh, so um, have they looked uh, into other, uh, and the Navajo, they could have just talked to Navajo. Have they had on that commission anyone who is from that background, or at least anthropologists who spend time studying people like that mm -hmm. and their narratives and how they survived to, through thousands of thousands yes, of years? Yes, they both had archaeologists and uh, and anthropologists as well as languages. You know, Fred Newmeyer, the historian of linguistics, who was on the commission. Uh, Ward Goodenough was the anthropologist on the commission. There's a, an archaeologist. They looked at uh, ancient Indian, the, like the Snake Monument in west in the in the southeast United States. They looked at uh, the Acropolis. They looked at uh, Stonehenge. They looked at uh, many different archaeological sites and tried to figure out what meaning was preserved from these different sites. What you could actually understand from it. So did but you roughly show, or did you show what you showed? Were just it's a work in progress, right? It's not done. They haven't decided anything yet. They always have to have something on file in order to continue working, but the but it won't be built until the site is no longer being used. As long as it's okay. being used, there are these private security guards called walking huts that go around with okay. half tracks and machine guns. You don't need uh, okay. you don't need warning signs. Yeah, okay, I was just trying to establish at which stage is, the, is this final, like when they sent the Voyager out, I remember looking at all the things, and, and I'm a scientist, and I just was scratching my head. I was like, whose idea was 90% of this, I just don't, I don't agree. I don't think this is logical. I don't think anyone seeing these images will think what we think they're going to think. I think it's, yeah, it's like really. <laughs> um, why we have rough cut screenings of our films because we don't know. Yeah. And people say, that doesn't really make sense. Maybe you should. Um, they didn't have a rough cut screening, apparently. The aliens didn't show up. Right. Um, and also, just to say quickly, that Nikki Nuke, they, they created, but it's the only one, all the other ones, their charge was to make scenarios in which people would overlook the marking system and dig anyway. And Nikki Nuke is the only one in which they didn't. Um, that it lasts for 10,000 years. That, their families come, they look, the story's told, and it's housed in this sort of, like, kind of absurd, you know, theme park, nuclear theme park. Uh, but it, it was like, they, it was a renegade scenario that they were not, they did on their own because they thought, it was, you know, we should do at least one that works instead of all that don't. There was a, when they, when they set out the rule in 1983, uh, this, I, I've actually, I got the, uh, all the letters that were sent to the to the to the EPA, and one of them comes from a Northwest Indian tribe who says, you know, most of the most of the letters say, you know, ten thousand years, it's absurdly long. How could we expect? And they wrote and they said, ten thousand years, we've been here, according to the anthropologists, for fifteen thousand years. Our records say we've been here for thirty-five thousand years, and P.S. We're going to be here forever. So uh, you, the rest of you, you're all immigrants and emigrants and. You know, you come and go, we're not going anywhere. We've never gone anywhere, we're not going anywhere. And so 10,000 years is 
a surface scratch on our, on our timeline. They did not. And it's a good question. And you could actually see, you know, like, could they house the story? Um, you know, would there be a way to collaborate in this way? Because, as you say, the, the artwork's been around for a very long time. People are very connected to a piece of land, that there's stories that have persisted for all this time. And could this be one of the stories? Could we collaborate? And it's a totally interesting thought. It's one of the reasons we've been so happy that, that our film has been shown uh, to all six sites that are being contemplated for an international waste jump, dump in uh, Australia. And um, so we know we're hoping to hear more from the various Aboriginal groups that have been looking at the film and using it. Yeah, so um, the, the film addresses the challenge of communicating the message, but then there's a separate challenge of actually having people take it seriously. Yes. Um, and I feel like the story also has that same issue, even if you make this narrative. Um, you know, I can't think of a, an instance where our society has like seen something really old and actually taken uh, that seriously as something, um, usually, you know, we say, oh, it was their spiritual beliefs, or it was, um, you know, and, and we, uh, we limit the message to something that was inside of their culture and doesn't apply to us, and you, you address that with the Japanese example. Right. I'm wondering what the futurists thought of as possible strategies for um, not just communicating the message, but actually having it be taken seriously. Well, it's precisely what they tried to do all along. I mean, they, they created this, this two-tiered idea of how to think about, their charge was how to mark for 10,000 years, how to c communicate with people for 10,000 years not to dig here. So there was a specific message and a specific time frame. And the way that they did that was to create scenarios in which people would do exactly what you're saying, that they would overlook the message and dig anyway. And that this was supposed to help the markers panels think about, well, how would you mark it? And then there were disagreements in the markers panels about, you know, should it be visceral, like Brill said? You know, should it be just something immersive and visceral, um, artistic? And uh, other people thought, it, no, it needed to be more informational. Ultimately, they ended up doing a lot of everything since they just didn't know. There was no, I think, no... And by the end, I mean, you know, while, like, this moment before it's finished, which is not the end. Um, but they ended up putting redundancies. They put things in languages. They put things below ground, above ground. Um, they did it in every conceivable way. How you make people take something seriously, um, you know, as opposed to just giving the information so they can understand, um, seems, as you say, um, we've never done a very good job of it. We Im immediately turn it into folklore or superstition or something quaint or something, you know, isn't that interesting that people thought that, you know, 50 years ago, 1,000 years ago. Um, they think if you haven't... They, yeah. they think our best shot is something that's continuously used or understood. And um, you know, of all the archaeological monuments or entities that they looked at, they thought the most successful was the Acropolis because you had a mix of both written sources and physical you know, representation. So you know, our, our knowledge of Periclean Athens is infinitely better than of Stonehenge, where you know, people are still just shooting in the dark. I mean, they just have, you know, we, have very, we still have very little idea what Stonehenge is, despite a million theories that claim to know exactly. And um, so they made, you know, some of the scenarios are funny, and they knew they were funny, but they were, they were like, uh, well, what if Thomas Kuhn became a cult? And uh, they, uh, people became convinced that science was only true for a particular context and culture. And so they, they, they discovered the warnings, they understood them, they knew what it said, but they didn't believe it. They said that was just truth for 1989. And um, our truth is different, our truth is that these are there. Or people read them, understand them, like, um, like us with certain commons tomb, and they say, oh, you know, when we showed a scenario like that, they, oh, you know, they say go away and every generation in the future will be, you know, your children and children's children's children will die horrible, painful deaths. Don't dig here no matter what happens. And, um, you know, the German archaeologists, starting with the German archaeologists of the 1860s or so, they, you know, we dig like crazy. We consider it to be an indication that there's treasure. Death. They even thought, they didn't publish this, but one of the futurists uh, told me that 
that, that they thought of putting a fake treasure halfway down and that there would be like some like box of like semi-precious things and then they would go, they'd find them and then go home. Uh, uh, you know, they'd say, oh God, we got it. Uh, and um, so, you know, they, they, they really tried hard to think about these issues. They, uh, not, there are lots of other scenarios that they looked at. Okay, last question. Um, so given that this material could be used to maybe like make a dirty bomb, um, who's paying for the security in the time between when we know where the site is and when it becomes lost to society? The time between the what? So eventually these sites will probably be lost to the world and we won't know where they are and we have these markers to identify them. But for now, everyone knows where they are. Um, so they're, they're guarded while they're in active use. And the question will be, in 25 years, when the website is full, say, um, what will happen? And, and I think the idea, I think that nothing will happen. I think that they will be open, that nobody will want to pay for them, that it's the same logic that keeps all the nuclear, that keeps the spent fuel rods in the pools, is that it's like, it's like part of doing business as long as we're making money, as long as it's part of, but once we're no longer, it's not active, the, 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 the nuclear power plant, it, there's no bottom line, there's nothing written to any contract that says, well, we will be responsible for this. Um, and it's going to stay in the pools, or it's going to go into dry casts, or maybe we're going to put it underground. But once it goes underground, I think that it will be available to, um, you know, to be recovered for dirty bombs. I think, you know, if, and then if somebody makes one, maybe there'll be some policy that will last a short amount of time. Uh, there's a lot of sites where this stuff will exist, and it seems that the political will to do something about that seems... It's partly why it seems to me better to put it underground because it's just harder to get than leaving it above ground, uh, less access to it. Um, more consolidated is probably better because you can maybe contain it within a... Uh, but I think it's a good question. I think it's a very good question. I, I mean, the and title I, of the, the, the study was Inadvertent Intrusion. They never thought they were going to guard for 10,000 years someone with bad intent. And remember, this is 89-91. It was 10 years later, the future changed dramatically with Mr. Bin Laden. So, but they were not, I mean, terrorism was not part of their, their, their worry. And now, of course, it would be the first thing on your, on your list. You, you know, wh what are you most worried about, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's terrorism. And uh, but in 1989, 1991, that was not on people's mind, and especially since now it seems likely that they'll start burying actual, you know, the surplus plutonium from weapons. That's a, I mean, I don't know how they, I don't know what the security arrangement is for that or what form, they, whether they can, what their, what their plan is to try to make that at least difficult to extract. This is one of the issues with the U.S. government being unable to cite either their interim federal storage or the final storage for this because that 1982 law we've been talking about says that once they establish those facilities, the U.S. government would actually take title from, of all of this waste. Um, right now it's held by private entities except for the weapons grade stuff, which is, is the federal government. So part of this was an idea that we put it all in one or two or a few places and title actually officially passes. So there's one entity on the hook, whether that entity is going to be here thousands of years from now, obviously it's still an open question, but there was that, that um, provision in the law. But since we don't have that and we have everybody scattered, it's sort of it's, it's on the onus of either the private operator or the federal facility that has it stored now. And one thing is that they're actually, the weapons waste is not under the control of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And it's one of the frustrations of the NRC that they can't impose any standards on that. That's entirely DOE. So, or DOE under supervision by a combination of the state EPA and the federal EPA. So it's complicated. The regulatory structure is a is a big mess. So when the when the when Los Alamos packed the wrong kitty litter into the <laughs> into the radio radioactive salts uh, got mixed in with this instead of clay based kitty litter, it was wheat based. It's the sweet scoop. You may use it for your cat at home, but if you use the sweet scoop uh, kitty litter, which is wheat based, uh, it it you have a fuel that can then combine with the radioactive salts to actually make a patented explosive. And that's what happened. One of the Los Alamos cans uh, blew, you know, 
caught fire underground. Um, but when that happened, uh, New Mexico was suing uh, the federal government. The WIP contractor was trying to wiggle its way out because uh, you know, it's a, you know, they, they, didn't, they didn't want their budget influenced by the cleanup. They wanted that to be on top of their annual budget, even though they weren't actually burying something. And one of the things we should stop because it's 7.30, but one of the things that really struck us was that the heaviest secrecy was not the DOE, EPA, federal government, nuclear weapons. It was the private contractors. And, you know, with the federal government, they're always like, on the one hand, if we're too secretive, we'll get in trouble and we have to obey Freedom of Information Act. On the other hand, we could be embarrassed or we could get into trouble, you know, with additional regulation. The... Private companies have only one hand. Yeah. Are we going to do this? No. It could not possibly bring us any good, and we won't do it. So whenever, you know, both in the secrecy film and in this film, the, it was not the CIA or the NSA that was the toughest nut to crack for us. It was the private contractors. They're making a lot of money from this. They've raised their rates virtually <coughs> since they've been privatized. These functions have been privatized. And they don't want to cooperate at all. The only way we got into the website to film was because the DOE people were helping us argue against the waste, the, the what's true called solution. true waste, okay, waste true solution, Washington true, the contractor. But all these plants, Los Alamos, they, they're all GOCO, they're all government operated, government owned, corporate operated. And the private companies, Bechtel, DuPont, Union Carbide, they, they don't want to have anything to do with. Uh, uh, any form of information disclosure. Los Alamos is much harder to get information out of than it was when it was a government plant. Well, I, I feel that you found the sweet spot between terror mm -hmm. and awe. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that uh, I'd like to ask everybody to join me in thanking our panel and our filmmakers. <laughs>